Well, good morning, Calvary family. It's a joy to be with you today. Why don't we stand together wherever you are? Why don't you get to your feet? We're going to sing some songs, but before we do, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. Lord God, we have always needed you. And in this strange time, our need of you has not diminished, Lord. For most of us, it has grown. And as the world around us is shaken, Lord, we know that we can trust in you. And so standing together in our bedrooms and in our living rooms across the world today, we remember your goodness. We remember the truth of your word. We remember your power and we declare it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. See 
Okay. Everybody, welcome to the True Lock uh, home. It's great to uh, be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Paul Trulock. I'm Stephanie Trulock. I'm Megan Trulock. Megan, unfortunately, <laughs> has been our only child for the last month. She goes to school at Wayne State and has been uh, quarantined with us. Our other two children uh, are in Grand Rapids and are quarantined there. We look forward to uh, the day when we can all be back together, as I'm sure many of you uh, look forward to being together with your family. And certainly we look forward to being together as a church family. Uh, but until then, uh, what we have clung to is Romans 8.28, for we know that all things work for the good uh, of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, called for God's good. And so we uh, have been intentional in looking for ways in which uh, God has uh, placed us in this opportunity to uh, spread his gospel. We know this has not been a surprise to him, and we look forward to what he's going to be doing in and through us during this time. We are so glad that each of you are here with us this morning, and we would love to have record of that. So if you would go to cbcjoy.org slash guestbook and just fill that out, and you can also add prayer requests and praises in that, and our staff um, is praying every week for us um, and, and for those prayer requests. So please go there and do that um, as soon as you can. Thanks. Speaking of prayer, Wednesday nights, join Pastor Dave on Zoom at 7 o'clock. Um, the info was emailed to you guys, and it's also on the Facebook page, so check that out. Join in for prayer. It's going to be an awesome time. And also, um, most of you would have received this week um, a letter or email from Dave and Dan, and what an exciting email that was to see um, how as a family that we've given um, to the point where we're able to um, be able to do extra ministries during this time um, and really be the hands and feet of Jesus um, to our community and our surrounding communities. So we just want to encourage you to continue giving. Um, we know this is a hard time for many, but um, any little bit that you can give, God takes that and uses it. And so we are so thankful for each of you and your willingness to do that. So if you would go to um, cbcjoy.org slash give, um, we would love that. If you are having trouble or need help with that, you can call the church at 734-455-0022. Awesome. Okay, well, let's uh, let's pray for the rest of our service. Heavenly Father, uh, we do uh, thank you that you are always in control, that nothing is ever a surprise to you. And Lord, as difficult as this time uh, is for many of us, um, we pray that it would draw us closer to you. We pray that you would create opportunities for us to share uh, your love and what you've uh, done uh, through your son in bringing us uh, uh, to yourself. And Lord, we pray that uh, for the rest of this service uh, that you would be glorified. We thank you for all of the work that everybody uh, at, uh, and our staff has done uh, to, to create this uh, church uh, experience for us, a family experience for us. Uh, to come together during this time. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we look forward to what you're going to be doing uh, throughout the service and uh, in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, okay. <laughs> A torrent of destruction hid my darkened soul from rescuing. I cried to God for help, he heard my voice. The tainted earth, it rocked and reeled. The heavens bowed, the mountains kneeled. The thunderous voice of God, my covering. Oh, I will not.
Hey, thanks so much, Emma and Rich, for again leading us in worship today. And to all of you, whether it's your first time here at our online service or you're a regular attender, welcome. So glad to welcome you into my home, and I'm, I'm grateful that you've invited me into yours as well. You know, in Jesus' day, uh, Israel, ancient Palestine, it was an occupied land. And he, along with all the others living there, they had their own crises going on there as well. They lived under a dictatorship. Uh, the empire of Rome. It was a culture of might makes right. There were no uh, real emphasis on, there was no real emphasis on human rights. There was the absence of any state provided social safety net for people. In fact, it was a land of many peasants and they were stuck in a lifetime of poverty, generation after generation after generation. There were very high taxes. There was a lot of corruption. And in general, there was very little recourse for those who might be getting exploited by the powerful. There weren't things like, like labor laws or, or unions. There weren't standards of practice or rights for people to have as protections for them. So they were facing tough times. There was a high level of stress in Jesus' culture in the time in which he lived. And we know, of course, that right now, all around the world, it's a very high level of stress as we go through the global pandemic. Everyone everywhere is experiencing a fear, emotional angst, uncertainty, and much more. The COVID-19 virus has led to a culture of separation, isolation, sickness, and of course, death. Not only that, but we, we feel the economic stress of this as well. There's the devaluation of the stock market, we have small business owners that are very worried and Fortune 500 companies are as well. Nearly 2,200 million Americans have filed first time unemployment claims since mid-March. The tourism industry is pretty much non-existent. The sports and entertainment industries are as well. We've got executive orders of shelter in place, uh, uh, mandated quarantine, stay home, stay safe. And in the midst of that, we also see that the, the trust in government leaders is, is kind of waning and there's a, a growing sense even of frustration. We saw that kind of spill over in our own state this week as there was a protest that took place in, in Lansing. And I, I'm not speaking about the rightness or wrongness of the protest, but just using it to illustrate, again, the level of frustration that people are feeling about what, they're, what we're all going through. We wonder, what's the future look like? And when will that future get here? And then there is the condition of our homes, the condition of our souls, the condition of our hearts, the condition of our very beings. What's the foundation of our homes? What's the foundation of our lives? That's an important question for us to answer, as we're going to see in just a moment when I read a, a story that Jesus told uh, when he was walking the earth. You know, it's, it's funny at this time, we see that like because we're uh, so many of us are in our homes for so long periods, such long periods of time that uh, there's been there was a, been kind of a surge in DIY projects. Right. And those DIY projects, uh, I would I was kind of imagine that most of the home improvement projects that people have done or are doing are are more cosmetic. Right. They're, they're about maybe changing paint color, um, hanging some pictures, maybe fixing something, you know, a little, a little hole in the wall. Uh, floor coverings, window coverings, things like that, things to make, uh, make it look better uh, that have been kind of like on the to-do list for a, a long time and, and we're finally getting around to them. But I, I think that in the same way that most likely most of the changes that we're doing are cosmetic and not structural, I think that's kind of the way we handle life. We, we try to apply cosmetic changes to our being so that we present a certain image to someone else when Underneath all of that, structurally, in, our, in the infrastructure of our being, it's crumbling. You know, as we think about that idea, just consider it. I want us to take a look at the conclusion to perhaps the most famous or at least well-known uh, sermon that Jesus ever gave. I'm going to be reading from uh, Matthew chapter 7, the last verses of that, verses 24 through 27. And... 
And the context of it is that just ahead of that, Matthew records that Jesus has told a story about two ways or two gates. And they, the, this, the kind of the, the big point of main point of that story of the two ways is that we need to examine the cost of, of a profession in Jesus. And then there's the story of two trees, a good tree and a bad tree. And then the story of two trees calls us to consider whether our lives have really changed. Are we bearing good fruit or bad fruit? And now after those two stories, then we come to the story of two builders. And so I'm going to read again from Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 24. Follow along. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word together with other followers of Jesus, we pray that you would take this truth that Jesus shares and use it to change us. God, by the, by the power of, of your Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves and our time to you so that again, as we often pray, God, that at the end of our time, it wouldn't just be about uh, us having a little bit more information about this one particular story that Jesus told, but instead that you would change us, change us from the inside out change us at our core, change us at the foundation of our life, that we might be people who understand what it means to build on the rock. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So in the story that I just read, it's simple, right? There are two people that are contrasted by Jesus. Each one builds a house. And I envision that each house uh, probably looks, looks great. Just let my imagination run a little bit. It looks great. It looks secure. It looks solid. It looks like some place in which we'd all like to live, especially in, in good times and good weather. And you think about how in life sometimes it's like that, like things are just kind of sailing along for us. It's going well. I mean, we're just really banging it out. We're getting ready to graduate from high school or college and we look forward to a, a bright future. We have a lot of hopes and aspirations. We're looking forward to our maybe our first job or some others. You're looking forward to this, this great job that you just got or, or the, the, the new job that's out there and that you're, that you're gunning for. Maybe relationally, we've, we've met someone and we're taking the next step in that relationship. Maybe we're even getting married or planning to do so. Maybe for some of you, it's the first child or the next child. Maybe in general, it's just like, man, we're living the dream. And you know, just like that, each house kind of looks dreamy in good weather. And yet Jesus is speaking into a volatile culture here. As I said, it's, it's a culture uh, that's occupied by a foreign power. They would love to overthrow that foreign power, but they, they recognize that most likely they don't have it within them to, to be able to get the job done. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of disappointment, there's a lot of frustration. The storm comes to these houses. Each house experiences the storm, right? So each house is, bu is built and each one experiences the storm, but the story is not, it's not about the weather, it's not about the storm. The story is about building something that can withstand a storm. That's a big difference. I'm going to speak about the storm. The same storm hits both houses, but it's about which one can withstand it. The storm reveals the actual structural integrity of the dwelling. The storms have hit in 2020, right? We talked about that, the, the, the coronavirus pandemic, the stock market crash, fear everywhere. And yet, the Bible says in Proverbs 12 that the house of the righteous stands firm. Can that really be true? Can there really be a, a way in which 
while everything else around us is raging, while the storm, uh, as the storm is going on all around us, can there really be a way in which we build so that the house of the righteous really does stand firm? You see, each builder in this parable that Jesus told has a choice to make. And this is the fundamental, and really it's the only difference between the two, what the wise man does and what the foolish man does. One chooses to build on sand, and one chooses to build on solid rock. William Barclay, who's a, a, a commentator on Scripture, uh, says in his commentary on Luke that in the summer there in Palestine, that many of the, of the rivers dried up altogether, and so it kind of left a, a kind of a sandy bed that was empty of the water that once was there. But, it, but in the winter, after the September rains had come, the empty riverbed, it actually became like this raging torrent. But many of people who were, who were kind of looking for a site for their house, they found this inviting stretch of, of, of sand, of open land, and they built there only to discover that when the winter storms came, that the house that they had been built, that had been built in the middle of that empty riverbed was swept away. But the wise person, the wise person searches for a place and builds on rock. You see, the question that we need to begin asking ourselves in light of the story that Jesus is telling is, on what kind of foundation am I building my life? And Jesus' suggesting, suggestion to us is this, that the only lasting foundation is obedience to his teaching. So why would we build on sand? If that's true, why would we ever build on sand? Why do we choose to build on sand? Why do we do that in our lives? Well, Barclay, again, gives a, a couple of insights into that. He's, he says, number one, we don't like to work hard. And so sometimes it's just easier to, to, it's easier to address that cosmetic changes. It's easier to do something so that we can present a better image rather than address the emotional and spiritual infrastructure of our lives. So we, we, we build on sand because we want to avoid the work, the toil, and the pain that it takes to build on rock. And second, we're short-sighted. It's very hard for most of us to keep the long view. We think about today, tomorrow, maybe next week, but we don't think about years down the road. So it's easy it's easier, I guess I would say, to build on sand. And it's also short-sighted to build on sand. But what is sand? What, what are some contemporary uh, kind of ways to understand what, what would we be building on if we're building on something other than the than obedience to the teachings of Jesus? How could that kind of symptom out in our lives? Well, one thing that's sand for sure is money, right? Money is sand. The stock market crashes. We face economic storms. We experienced that kind of thing as a country in 19, uh, in the world too, right? Right. 1929, 1987, 2008, 2020, and other times as well. We saw, we saw headlines in this, in this latest economic crisis, things like major North American indices continued to plunge Thursday as news of large scale cancellations failed to ease investors' concerns about the spread of the novel coronavirus pandemic. Alan Small was a senior investment advisor who had been, been working in, in the investment world for almost 25 years, said this, this is an unprecedented fall. That word unprecedented, right? We've used it so often in the last six, seven weeks. We saw the Dow Jones plunge. We saw people say things like, uh, again, investment advisors say things like that. I've never seen the velocity of this fall as steep or as quick as it is. As we experienced all that, it might be good to be reminded of what Paul told his son in the faith, his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. He said this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, it's sandy, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Money is sand. Beauty is sand, right? <laughs> Physical appearance, it's sand. 
we get old, we get wrinkled, we have uh, marks and things happening to our bodies that we never even dreamed of when we were 17 or 27 or 35 or whatever the case might be. Our reputation even can be sand because we know that it can be ruined. In our day, social media can ruin us with rumors and lies. Popularity is sand. People are fickle. They like us and then they don't. Our career, in fact, can be sand, right? We can get downsized or passed over for a pr promotion. We face things like recessions and we thought ourselves to be pretty much indispensable, but we found out that it was pretty easy for the, someone to get rid of us, right? And again, think of those 22 million Americans filing those first time unemployment claims since mid-March. Certainly, uh, they have realized that their career is, is quite sandy. Our health is sand as well, right? One call from our doctor, one conversation with a physician, and that can change everything from us, for us. We thought we were fine, healthy, anticipating a really long life, and then the words come, the diagnosis comes, and all of a sudden we realize our health is sand. Education and, and intellect is sand as well. Now, I'm, I'm not anti-education, I, I, I have degrees. <laughs> Uh, I'm a high school graduate, I got, I got a bachelor's degree, I've got a master's degree, but I recognize that degrees and, and an increase in knowledge alone, they, those things alone do not equate to success, to satisfaction, to happiness, or to stability. Talent is sand, right? Athletic talent or artistic talent. Uh, in, in sports, you can blow out your knee and be done. In the arts, you know, it can be, someone might just be a little bit better than you, and so you lose out on that role or that opportunity and, or whatever the, the, the case might be. In fact, I, I would suggest to you as we think about it, again, based on what Jesus is, is inviting us to consider related to building our lives on Him and His teaching, obedience to His teaching, that in, in, a, in a sense, everything is sand. Everything else uh, apart from that is sand. Think, if you would, about, about uh, a couple of verses from the, from the book of James. James is a book of action. James is all about uh, taking our, our faith and living it out. Not saying, this is what I believe, but showing others what we believe by how we live. And in the fourth chapter of that, verses 13 and 14, James says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. If that's true, if life is like that, and we, we kind of inherently know that it is that way, even though we, we kind of think that we'll always be here and there will always be a tomorrow, like James says, we don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So if there is that much uncertainty about, uh, about life, and about the future, wouldn't it be great to be certain of something? Wouldn't it be great to build our life in, an, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a culture of uncertainty? Wouldn't it be better to build it on something that is certain? That's what Jesus is inviting us to do here. His clear call is this. Here's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. Build your life on me, on my words, on my work, on my way. Jesus is giving us this clear and direct challenge. Hear and practice my words. This is the big idea of today's talk. This is the main point of the parable that Jesus is telling. Build your life on the person, on the words, and the works of Jesus Christ because he is the sure foundation. Is this true? Can you believe that? Most of us don't. Many of us, in fact, think that there's something else besides that. And we search for it. We grope after it. We run after it. We chase after it. And yet again, Jesus is saying in this clear call, build your life on me. Build your life on my works. Build your life, life on my words. Build your life on my way. Back in that book of James chapter one, James says this about, about us. <laughs> says in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Well, that would be, that's foolish, right? That's ridiculous. Look at your face in the mirror and then walk away and forget what you look like? Well, just as foolish as it is to think that someone could do that, so it is foolish to listen to the word and not obey it. To build our life again on something other than obedience to the teaching of Jesus. But most people, most of us, in fact, maybe even some of us watching this right now, are building on sand. But Jesus calls us to build our lives on him. Build your life on him. Build your relationships on him. Build everything around your finances on him. Build your hobbies, your dreams. Don't merely live for yourself. Live for him. Give yourself wholly, completely, and totally over to him, to his work and to his mission in the world. That's what he's calling for. Don't merely invest your money in a, in a 401k or a 403b, which is what did, what did Paul tell Timothy? It's, it's uncertain. Invest in the kingdom of God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What are these words of Jesus upon which we build our life? If Jesus is saying to us, listen, build your life on me, build your life on my works, build your life on my words, build your life on the way in which I teach you to live, what are some of the, what are some examples of that? Well, Jesus says in, in Mark chapter 8, these things, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus was asked the greatest command, he said, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, the clincher was Jesus said he was going to die. He was going to be killed. And he was. But he was going to be, be raised from the dead. And he was. We celebrated that last week on Easter. And now he also says that one day he's coming back. And he will. He says to us, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Just those few words, just those few examples of things, of the words of Jesus upon which we can build our life. Give us a, both an invitation into being with him and the challenge to live it out in our everyday lives. You know, <laughs> We're all kind of shaking our heads, right, about the, the, the famous run on, on toilet tissue. It shows that fear and, and overreaction is such a powerful force. Well, I'm afraid I'm not prepared. How ironic is it that people hoard toilet tissue and yet so often neglect the core matter of a relationship with God? The work of our enemy in fact, is to, is to blind us to that very need, that we even need a relationship with God. And that's why it becomes something that many never address. But Jesus invites us to build our lives on him. He is the sure foundation. So why would we build on sand? If we build on anything other than him, the risk is so great. Not only will our lives crash eventually when we face the storms that ultimately, inevitably will come, but someday in eternity, we will not be able to receive the gift of eternal life if we've not allowed the way and the person of Jesus to be the one who's changed us. The risk is great. 
You know, when you think about the, the risk of, of storms and the amount of shaking that's going on in our lives, you know, certainly the, the image of an earthquake would, would come to mind, right? When the, the Koalinga earthquake happened in May of 1983 in Northern California, there were some things that were discovered. Houses that were, were built and were bolted to their foundation withstood that, that uh, 6.7 Richter scale quake. The structure would move, of course, but, but if it was bolted to the foundation, it withstood. Psalm 55, uh, 22 says this, Give all your cares to the Lord, and He will give you strength. He will never let those who are right with Him be shaken. In a prayer time that I was involved in this, uh, this week, I appreciated how one person was was quoted uh, uh, that verse, and, and as she quoted it, she, in her prayer, uh, kind of like in a very transparent way, just said to God, you know, God, we feel very shaky, but yet your word says we won't be shaken. So in faith, we stand in that promise that we will not be shaken, even though we feel very shaky because of everything going on around us. Those houses in Koalinga, because they were bolted to the foundation. Though they felt very shaky, they ultimately withstood the quake. They couldn't be shaken. They didn't collapse. Now, on the other hand, the houses that were built in a period when they weren't bolted to the foundation, again, probably a perfectly good house, perfectly good, perfectly good house looked great. But when that earthquake hit, the house, in some cases, moved six or seven inches off its foundation and it caused many to collapse, just like the house in the story that Jesus told. And so that was a great discovery made at Koalinga back in the 80s. Houses should be bolted to their foundation. Jesus says this, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to your standard of, standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words and Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard anything like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying, quite a contrast to their religion teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. That paraphrase by Eugene Peterson of the passage that I read earlier, I thought very poignantly and very clearly gave us the heart of what Jesus was trying to share with us. Remember, it was in the context of him saying, listen, there are two ways have you examined the cost of what it means to have a profession in me? And then he, Jesus told the story of the two trees and which called us to consider whether our lives have really been changed. What kind of fruit is the tree of our life really bearing, good fruit or bad fruit? And now it's the story of the two houses and reminds us that true faith in Christ is that which will last in the storms of life and ultimately in the final judgment. So again, I'll ask you, on what or on whom are you building your life? There's a Christian author named Henry Nowen, and in a devotional tool that I was using this week, there was a portion of one of his books that was within that devotional tool, and I found that it's so insightful and challenging and, and honest and very applicable to uh, what we're talking about today. 
And in, in the book, uh, A Cry for Mercy by now, and he says this, O oh Lord, what else or who else or what else can I desire but you? You know me through and through. In and through you, everything finds its origin and goal. You embrace all that exists and care for it with your love and compassion. Why then do I keep expecting happiness and satisfaction outside of you? Why do I ignore you or keep relating to you as one of my many relationships instead of my only relationship in which all others are grounded? Why do I keep chasing after popularity, respect from others, success, acclaim, sensual pleasures, and more? Why is it so hard for me to make you my one? Why do I keep hesitating to surrender myself totally to you? Those questions that Nowen asks are questions that are certainly related to the story of the two builders that Jesus told. He goes on in that book to offer really up a prayer. And in that prayer, it's a prayer of confession and it's also a prayer of commitment. And I'd like to pray that prayer this morning with you. And if you like now and maybe would ask the Lord some of those same questions that I just read, and you sense God's Holy Spirit drawing you into a place that you would like to surrender your life over to him and, and embrace that commitment to make Jesus the foundation of your life, so that in the storms of life and at the ultimate final judgment that you can have confidence that you will stand because you have received him by faith and walk after him in obedience by the presence of his Holy Spirit in your life. If you would like to pray and respond in that manner, then I invite you to pray these words that will be on the screen along with me. Help me, God to let my old self die, to let die the thousand big and small ways in which I am still building up my false self and clinging to my old desires. Let me be reborn in you and see through you the world in the right way so that all my thoughts, words, and actions can become a song of praise to you. I need your loving and amazing grace to travel on this road that leads to the death of my old self and to a new life in, through, and for you. I trust that this road is the way of true freedom. I receive you as the Lord of my heart, my mind, my soul, my own. Amen. You know, this walking in obedience to Jesus, uh, we're never designed to do that on our own. In fact, I think it, it's impossible for us to do that in our own strength and ability. We need the presence of God in our life. The presence of his Holy Spirit will allow us to live in obedience to Jesus. And we also need a community of other believers. We need to be connected to other sisters and brothers in Christ so that they can come alongside us and encourage us. You know, one of the very practical ways that we're doing that here at Calvary is we've started something called virtual life groups or VLGs. And in a VLG, one of the things that will happen is uh, we'll take the, the content of the Sunday morning message and, and we'll chew on it. We'll discuss it. Discuss it. There'll be some, some questions, just like some of the questions that, that now and asked in that, in that book, A Cry for Mercy. We'll, we'll use some questions that will prompt greater ownership and obedience to the teaching, not just a knowledge of the teaching. So I encourage you to maybe consider being part of one of those life groups. You can check out um, what they're all about at cbcjoy.org slash life group. And um, there are some of you who have you know, you spent some time thinking about you know, being a leader of one of those groups or being a participant in one. And I just wanna encourage you to take that step of faith and, and just do dive in and get involved in that way. I really do think it will be very beneficial for your walk of obedience uh, to the person and the, and the teachings of Jesus, which again 
is the only sure foundation on which uh, we should build our lives. Again, guys, as I said at the beginning of the talk, thanks so much uh, for um, being here with us today. I pray that it's been a blessing to you, and I pray that truly as we leave here, uh, we won't leave here with information alone, but we'll leave here with an inclination to walk after Jesus. And uh, as you do that, it will certainly bring God glory and honor and pleasure. And he and we will be right along with you, walking right along with you as you do. Let's pray. Thanks, God, for the chance to connect today. I pray that as we dismiss, we would walk in, in the presence of your peace, your strength, and your grace. Thanks so much, Lord, uh, for this call that we've received from Jesus today. And we pray that it would be a call that leads to obedience. And that we would be able to be unshaken, God. We would stand firm because we are building on the rock. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. See you soon.